So, good afternoon. Let's head for this last lecture for today. Yeah. Um, so, this lecture is going to be on language and vision. So, it's no vision any only anymore. Okay. And then, uh, just to start with, like, how many of you have know a little bit about language on deep learning? Have you taken any lecture on this? Natural language processing with deep learning? No? Okay. So, you see that there's going to be, like, a quick intro about how, how this is handled. Okay? So first I will acknowledge Antonio Bonafuentes, Pascual from the Spritz Processing Group here at UPC, and as well as Marta Ruiz Costa Jusa from Natural Language Processing Group. So maybe a first uh, way to motivate this talk in a summer school on vision is like this tip that Andrew Carpati, like one of these uh, instructors at Stanford, who was who is now at Tesla, but who at that time in 2016, he gave a, a talk uh, in CPR, and he kind of uh, concluded his talk saying, hey, you guys, so that was a conference on vision. He said, a uh, good advice for you would be that you look at what people on the uh, neural machine translation uh, community are doing, because they're also using deep learning for their task, and you might get some good ideas there. And actually, that's what I did. So I, I came back to UPC, and I talked to Marta, and Tony, and Jotirian Rodriguez Fonollosa, and and Javier Hernando and so all those people from speech and language say, hey, it seems that you are also working on deep learning, right? And they say, yeah, that, that's right. What's like a similar change that has uh, been experienced in vision that has happened as well in language or speech and in other uh, modalities. And then we started working together and we set up a, a course which was called Deep Learning for Speech and Language, which actually now it has become like, uh, it's a morning course now this, this, this week, the same week in the mornings. And also there are like some uh, courses in the, in the regular master, right? On, on speech, language, and deep learning. Then based on that, uh, we kind of uh, grew my interest in this time of modalities and kind of motivate me to give you this, this talk that goes beyond vision, okay? So first, what I'll do, I will explain the basic idea of what is an encoder and decoder archi architectures, because that gives us a framework in which we can combine vision and language. So actually, what I'm going to explain works for vision and text language, which is going to be the focus of today's talk, but it could also work for any other modality, like typically, for example, for speech or, or audio. So now we have uh, one ring that fits, that rules them all, actually, in multimedia. If you go to one of, any of these conferences of any of these domains, everybody's talking about the same thing, right? We are all talking about perceptrons and how we use perceptrons to solve whatever crazy task that we have in our scientific communities. And basically, we also kind of, uh, the way I like to think it is that we, what we are doing is we're taking our media, for example, an image, and we are encoding, encoding our media in a vector. Uh, in this case, this will be like the most uh, initial, where we started this, this summer course. We said, hey, the, there was a big revolution that was solving ImageNet in which you had an image, and we uh, projected this image in a one-hot vector in which what, each position of that vector encoded a semantic class. For example, like in this example, if there were only three classes, that would be like this image would be mapped into a one hot vector uh, for the position cat. And you can think that actually when we are classifying images with these softmax and all that, what we are doing is we're just projecting images into a, into a space. If you think like about this super simple uh, example in which we consider only three classes, like uh, hogs and dogs and cats, we can say that every, every image we're projecting it, encoding it into a one vector of, of three dimensions, right? And we, we are like solving classification problem with the softmax is like uh, representing these images with in a three uh, dimensional vector. Of course, we want to go much, mayor, much beyond than just having a, a one hot encoding with three positions. We want to have like representations that don't need to be like really one hot encodings, they can be any soft uh, encodings, um, they can be of any length, of any dimension. But in the end, that's what neural networks are doing. They are encoding your favorite media, whatever you want. It can be vision, it can be text, it can be language or speech. And I will, today we'll especially focus on text, but you could do the, the, the same with language or uh, with speech or, or, or audio. And actually, not only we can encode, but we, we can also decode this media. We can actually go from 
a one red encoding that says, hey, this is a cat, and then have a deconvolutional neural networks that's going, that are going to generate images of cats. Uh, you had uh, lectures from, with Albert Pumarola that was show you how to synthesize, how to generate new images, right? So you, you know that that's also possible. So in the end, the picture I would like you to, to have in mind is this one, that's the idea of the encoding and decoding networks that tell us that, okay, so whatever media you have, whatever multimedia document you have, you can encode in a, in a deep, in a learned presentation through a new, uh, deep neural network and decode it into another multimedia document of that modality of, of, of from another one. Yeah, and, and, and you can, here you can do like all the possible combinations that you want. Yeah, this lecture will focus on visual language, but you could do any other combination. So let's, as, as you told me that none of you had re actually experience about how to encode text, I guess that maybe that looks a bit challenging to you about, okay, uh, so it's very clear how to put pixels there, but what about words? How can we put words in there? Uh, so going to, I'm going to explain you how we can more or less encode text. Uh, very, very quickly, but I hope that's enough for you to get an idea. So let's imagine that you have a sentence, okay, and we want to have one representation, one vector with some dimensionality that will allow you to play with this encoding and decoder, decoding scheme. How can you do that? So can you, how can you fit a dictionary of, of words into a neural network? How, how, how do you do that? So one possible way to do it is, okay, so let's, we could start like letters by letters and maybe we could uh, assign them like an index and then like each uh, work could be a, a combination, a sequence of this letter that might be an option. But doing this kind of encoding actually is a bit weird because that would uh, kind of impose a fake order. It means that, that if, if we encode like one, two, three, whatever, like number one, number two, they are closer than number one and number 30, right? And maybe there's no, there's no, uh, priori there's no need to encode this similarity between letters um, in a numerical way. So maybe that's not the best option. Another option, and now here I'm only talking about letters, it's the, are the one-hot encodings. Okay, now we can, we, in the case we want to just to encode the, the letters, we could just have a vector of dimensionality uh, theory, I think we, we said, vocabulary of theory, and like at each position we assign it to a letter, and this way like each vector is as far away as any other. Yeah, here we are not imposing any similarity between letters in this case. What if instead of letters we have words? There's no, but it's the same story, right? Now we have many more uh, elements in the vocabulary than theory, but we're still going to have like how many? Like maybe 5K, 18K, 500K, Wikipedia, maybe 400K. If you start crawling data, maybe you can end up up to four, uh, 2 million uh, uh, different words. Okay, but it's not that bad, okay? That these are dimensions that we can really deal with. We can have, we could have like one hot encodings of, of these uh, sizes. And that's actually like the first step that you take when you encode text. Text, okay, it's only the first step. So normally, you will probably never be using that unless you really get into language. But that's a first step. Yeah. So imagine that you have you want to encode English. So you take like whatever. So maybe all the words. Or maybe you only take. Typically, what you do is you only take like the most frequent words. And maybe if there's there are some very weird weird words. You just discard them. Okay. So you can keep your vocabulary the dimension of your vocabulary to uh, to limit it and you encode them in a one-hot encoding vector, yeah? And, and that's something you can fit into a neural network, right? That's, there's nothing prevents you from doing that. But of course that has like some problems. It's going to be very large. Uh, most of these vectors are going to be zero, so it's not very efficient at all. And you can, I mean, here with these vectors, we can, we can only say if they are, if two vectors are the same or, or different. That's all we can do. That's not, that's, that, that isn't much. We, so that's not very rich. So what's a, a very common technique that people from the natural language community do is they, they actually, they, they start with this one hot encoding vectors, but then they project them into another vector, which is much shorter in terms of dimensionality. And that kind of has uh, some of these properties that we would like to, 
to have, like some maybe semantic meaning, so maybe some, some in the sense that maybe two vectors from two similar words would also be similar in terms of numerically, like that the two vectors would be uh, nearby in uh, L2 distance. How can we present that? So one way to project uh, these one-hot encodings into whatever representation is actually to train a neural network that's going to project our one-hot encodings into something shorter and more meaningful. Yeah? And as we know how to encode neural networks, how to train neural networks, that's something that would be feasible to do. Of course, so far we don't really know how to train that, but it's coming soon. So, um, one, um, so one uh, basic idea um, that, so, sorry, so, these representations, they exist. Now I'll show you some examples soon, okay? But they exist, I'll show you how to train them. Then if they exist, they're going to be like very high dimensional vectors, okay, more of several dimensions. And in order to see um, if, if, they, if they satisfy these qualities that I was mentioning, like maybe some uh, similarity in the L2 space uh, also means like semantic similarity. One method that scientists uh, typically do is that they use uh, visualization tools. Among them, one of the visualization tools that it's quite common uh, when doing di data analytics are these TSNE uh, representations. So this is, this is a technique that given data which is very high dimensional, okay, that allows you to map this data into a 2D representation in such a way that uh, those points that are nearby in a high dimensional space, when you map them on 2D, they'll be nearby, and those points which are far away in a high dimensional space, they're going to be far away when you map them in 2D. And if you do that in some magical way that you can know about when you, if you click over there, you're going to have uh, representations of words that uh, satisfy these qualities. So look here. So all these points that you see here, these are TSNE representations. So they are mappings on the to-do space because the, the, the screen is, is flat. But these mappings, they uh, satisfy these properties that I mentioned earlier. So uh, some people train some uh, word representations in a way that I'm going to explain later. And when they map them in a, in a TSNE, they actually saw like words like related to travel in pink. They were kind of nearby, maybe words related to relatives, like families, like father, mothers, whatever. They were nearby when predicting 2D and so on. Uh, words on cities, words on feelings, words on body parts. So they, 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 they observe that actually you can learn representations that, that kind of satisfy these uh, properties that want like similar semantic behaviors, they're going to be similar also in this high semantic space. Okay, now I'm just showing you how to visualize that, but I didn't tell you how to train, how to, how to actually obtain the representations, okay? Let's go for that. So there are, uh, sorry, there's another example. So that's one of these classic examples that actually like some people now criticize that maybe it's not that true, but whatever. But in general, the idea is that uh, if you project these words, like uh, niece, aunt, sister, they're going to be nearby in the high dimensional space. Nifo, uncle, brother, they're going to be nearby in the semantic space. Okay? And, in, and under some circumstances and under some conditions, also the relative positions, it also has some meaning, right? Like uh, female and male, the distribution of, of words, it's kind of, it follows a pattern. Okay? The, uh, again, there has been a recent paper that says that it's not always the case, it depends on some, some conditions, but still the, the concept of thing still applies. Okay, so let's see how can we represent, how can we project words into something that we're going to call it word embeddings. Okay, so this, the, the representation of words that satisfy these criteria are normally called word embeddings. So these are going to be vectors of reduced dimensions, typically 100, dimension 100, 500, okay? They're going to have some meaningful semantic and syntactic distances. And these are going to be representations, embeddings, that are going to be used for other tasks. Okay, so now I'm going to first explain how to encode it, and later I'll show you how we apply that for language and vision. 
in order to obtain these word embeddings, there are several techniques have been proposed. Okay, but um, these techniques basically they they always follow the idea that okay, you have a large an amount of text that you can maybe get from Wikipedia, from news articles, whatever, and you exploit the relations that words have on this text to learn these embeddings in a self-supervised way. Okay? There's no body really annotating anything. You just exploit that the word, the fact that words appear uh, in similar contexts uh, in different documents. In, they tend to repeat the context and the patterns. For example, this one, it's, two, 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 two. Oh, you can see the word, no, just the, the, the concept. So the concept here is that imagine that what you want to do is you have a, a sequence of words the cat sits on the, okay? And now what you do is you train a neural network that will try to predict what's the next word, okay? And, it's maybe, and maybe when you go to the data, your database, uh, you have a, a, a story where the sentence ends up with mat. So what you do is you, you have somehow you encode these words, you feed them into a neural network, and the neural network is trained to predict mat, okay? So that, that will be a softmax on top, in which the, you would like to have a, a one for the position of the, of the softmax that corresponds to head, to cat. Uh, sorry, to mat. Yeah? In order to train that, you, you only need text. That's all you need. You need anybody really doing any special annotation. There are many flavors of these types of approaches. That's what I was looking for, if I saw any. Uh, this other. Uh, that's the uh, word to back. Uh, that's, that's kind of, this word is quite famous, okay? For example, what they do is like, they look at the, they have a sentence, they have words in uh, time step t, t minus two, t minus one, t plus one, t plus two, and you predict what's the missing word here in the middle, yeah? That's uh, one way to train uh, neural networks. So the idea is that given the, the context, so you, if you have the sentence that, that, whoop, that the cat climb, climb a tree, you give the context, A cat the tree, and you want the network to predict climb. So you can, you can define a network to, for, to do that. Or the opposite, maybe you, can, you have the word climb, if it cli climb, and you would like to predict the context, A cat and the tree. Yeah, and you do that for a huge amount of, of text that you would have. Okay? So what kind of architectures would be suitable to train this in a very natural way? Do you know? So recurrent networks could be one way to very naturally uh, encode that because it's, it's just a sequence of, so in this case it's a <coughs> sequence as input and the output is one word. In this case, uh, the input is only one word but the output is a sequence. You could, you could train that in a, with recurrent neural networks. Um, yeah, that would be, yeah, actually that, that's the idea here. So this would be like the one hot encodings. So imagine that you have this uh, sentence, you encode them with a one hot vector, okay? And then um, you can, uh, once you, you have that, you would map it into word embedding. So this vector would be of uh, lower dimensions, and then the whole sentence, okay? So th this is a one hot. This is the word embedding that would, you would have trained with, maybe, for example, with word to back, for example. Something similar. You, you encode that into an LSTM, for example, or any RNN or GRU. You, encode, you can encode all the words in the sentence, and then at the very end, uh, keep the hidden state of your recurrent neural network. This given state, we have seen all these words. So now it's not that we encode only one word, but we can encode a whole sentence in a vector. Yeah. Remember that is, these are recurrent neural networks, so you must think that the, that the vector is against the, the screen. Yeah. So this, this is time. This, this direction is time. Okay. Actually, you could also encode that with commercial neural networks. Maybe that's not that. Uh, popular, but it's also possible, okay? With an autoregressive uh, approach, you can encode also text with commercial neural networks. 
that's also possible. You can click here if you want more details. I know that the classic one is recurrent, but it's, it's fine also to encode text with, with com. And actually, you could also encode uh, text with uh, transformer networks, architectures, yeah? So actually, that's one of the most uh, popular uh, word embeddings nowadays that you can uh, deal with. It's called BERT, OK? And it kind of follows the, the same approach. You have a sequence. And what you do is, like, uh, given uh, words of a sequence, you mask uh, part of, of the words of, of that text. And you ask the network to predict the, the words that are missing. Actually, they mask around 15%. Okay? And this was received a best paper in the last natural language processing conference. Uh, on, it's called NACL. Okay? I think there's already another word embedding that came up like a couple of weeks ago, which is even better. XBP2 or something like this. Do you know the names? Nobody knows? OK. Anyway, so I think that you, you use BERT, right? OK, so you see, like, some students, was it hard to use them? Well, I mean, the time tuning is pretty bad. The time tuning is good. OK. So if you use them, just make sure that you find units for your text, OK? But that's the classic, the classic way to, to go. If you want to deal with text, don't try to train your own word embeddings. Go online. You have good embeddings pre-trained there. But probably if you, you, need, you need to fine tune them to make them work for your, for your case, OK? Good, so now we know that there are tools to encode uh, text sentences in a vector. Can we do the opposite? So actually, yes, we can. Do. That's actually the super classic thing that you can do, for example, with recurrent neural networks. So if I have a representation of a sentence, I can decode that sentence. Maybe I, I want to reconstruct it. That maybe that's not very useful at all. But what's the classic, super classic example that you do with, with this, actually with this figure? that you, you encode a sentence in English, and what do you do then? You translate it in another language. Okay? You can translate it to French, right? So that's, that's one way that you encode in one language, you decode in the other. Actually, the, all this encoder-decoder framework, that comes a lot from this neural machine translation. That's why Angie Karpati was telling us, you should go and look what these people are doing. Okay? So text to text, encode in one language, decode with the other, and I think, yeah, that's the, the same idea. So do you know these sec-to-sec -sec models? Have you heard about it? So that's the, one of the most classic ones. So you encode the words in recurrent neural network, and once you have the representation of your sentence, you decode it, and you fit. So, if, so you start decoding, and the output of your, uh, of your network, it's, it's fed as input uh, for the next time step, so it predicts the, the next word based on the, on the predictions. Uh, released on previous time steps. Okay, that's called sec to sec scheme. Okay, I think that's that. This is the full story of what I've been explaining. Yeah, that's the basic, super basic neural machine translation. Okay, that's a sec to sec, and then there's also something else which is called attention. Uh, you should have heard about it in the in the lectures, so that you know that that improves performance quite a lot, because that uh, so when you decode, it's not that you it's not that, that you only look at the representation that you obtain at the last time step. So you, you have a, you encode a sentence, and it's not that you just look at the representation that was at the very end, but you can look at the representation at every time step. Okay, so that's, that's, that makes sense because I mean, in the very end, if you want, like, the, the last words are fresher, they are more present in the hidden state, but if you allow the network to look at the representation on every time step, that, that helps. Okay, and that's actually, like, the, that's kind of a, Easy-ish, simple-ish, simplish approach to deal with text. Because if you deal with text, so uh, I suggest that you start with sec this sec to sec with attention. There are many of the shelf models for that. Okay. Okay, that's more and more sec with attention. Uh, that the, it does exist. Commercial networks with attention. So there are all the <coughs> flavors that you can think about. You can, there's the self-attention. That's a transformer uh, model that maybe you've heard about it which um, improve quite a lot than the results on neural machine translation. OK, so I'm done now with this crash course on natural language processing with deep learning in 30 minutes. So, so just, I'm sorry, maybe it was a bit too intense, but at least that you should know about a little bit about these words. So in the morning, they spend a whole, the whole week during this course of vision, but on language. So it's, but now I summarize it everything in, 
in 20 minutes, okay? So now you know about text, more or less, or at least you know where to start from. Let's go how we can combine with vision. So if we follow the encoder decoder approach, um, we have all the tools we need, right? So we can fit a new network with an image and we can decode it, and we can decode text. And then the next question, like what's the use of that? What, what's, do you know what's the name of this task or application? If you have an image, sorry? Autoencoder auto auto would be if, if you fit an image and you obtain the same image at the output. But now we are going, for, we encode an image and we generate a sentence out of it, text for sentence. What's the name of this application? A label would be if we have only one. We, if we have a sentence, do you know? Captioning, captioning yeah? So this, the keyword is captioning. And that's it. And that's what our uh, dear Uriol Vinyals, UPC alum, alumnus, did in 2015. And he became, for, for this and many other things, quite popular. So he had been working on the learning for quite a lot, especially from coming from the uh, language, language and speech field. So he knew about RNNs, probably heard about how people were using CNNs to encode images. So he said, oh, why don't we encode the image with a CNN and decode the text with an RNN? And he, uh, he and of course the rest of the team, uh, they built a team to, for image captioning. Yeah? So it generates sentences of images, so which is much more richer than just having a, a label on ImageNet, right? Actually, at that time, uh, the team from Stanford, from Andrew Karpati, so that researcher from the first uh, slide, and Fei Fei Li, uh, creator of ImageNet, they did something similar. So that's kind of a, quite a, the same strategy. So both papers, they were published almost at the same time. Then if you remember the story, if you want to improve your caption, you should use attention. But now the attention is not over an input sentence. It must be over the features that you extract from an image. And that's what they did. In this work, they had this uh, show at an Anchel paper in which given an image, you actually allow the, an attention layer to focus on different parts of the image, uh, which is so, and, uh, so that the network learns where to look at. Okay? So here you have like some of these qualitative examples. It's not, they are not super spectacular, so I must warn you. So it, it improves the performance. It, it seems that more or less it looks at where the object is when it refers to, but it's okay. It's, you still should look at it with a bit cautiously, okay? But the performance improves, that's, that's for sure. Then the next step, uh, you know, because you are uh, been following this course. So first lecture, here I'll tell you about image Classification, we encode the whole image and we output labels. Second lecture, I think it was, or third lecture, Andreu came here and told you, okay, now you're going to know about object detection, right? If you take image captioning to the next level, what you caption are objects. So what if instead of um, having a caption for the whole image, we generate captions for each of the objects in, in a scene. That's what they did in this work. You, have, you detect the objects and for, for the features that you extract, for each detected object, you can generate captions. That's, if, you, if you have a database that you're going to annotate, nothing prevents you from doing that. Yeah? So actually, Amai and me, uh, when testing this demo live in CPR three years ago, and I got, we got results like, for me, man has short hair and Mar with short hair, that's fine. Amaya, a woman wearing black shirt, I don't think he sees the shirt, but the two men wearing black glasses, so. There were still like some inconsistencies, but it was running live demo, so it's, it's a quite a lot. Nice work. Okay, you also were, hopefully, on Friday in the last talk, if you stayed until the very end, and you know that things have evolved, and now we cannot only totally just generate captions, but actually like uh, predict a recipe out of an image, more or less. And well, I might already talk about it, but that would be like one of the most modern works on, on given image generating a not, not a caption, but actually a set of instructions about how to cook that recipe. And also our colleagues from CBC, uh, from the Autonoma, actually in CPR, they also present a, a work in which they generated captioning for uh, pictures on the news. Okay? And the novelty that they present basically is that when they were predicting the words, it's not that they were always predicting the word, but for example, they were predicting the type of word that would fit there. For example, in that image, 
it says the exterior of the so that place actually is the Brooklyn Academy of Music, but that's so so specific that it's hard to train a neural network to be so so specific. Should know about all the possible uh, buildings in the <laughs> in the world, right? And maybe it's easier to train a neural network to predict uh, the exterior of orc in like orc, like a generic term, and then later this can be weight with another uh, method, okay? Maybe with image retrieval or whatever. And they, they show some improvements with that. Okay. There's a, an issue with uh, deep learning in general, which are biases. Okay. Um, so you know that our study has some biases. Some of them, maybe they are not uh, desirable. And when you collect data sets um, and you feed them into your deep neural networks, it, those data sets, they have biases. These are your algorithms will also have this, the same biases. And that motivates this work uh, in which they observe that when you are generating captionings for some activities, uh, the captions tend to be gender biased. Okay, so I think that, so that tip, the title of the work was called uh, Women Also Snowboard, because they observe that in most captionings, whoever was snowboarding, normally you wear like a, a suit and you don't, it's really hard to know if it's a, a woman or a man, the captions tend to always uh, indicate uh, male actor, okay? And they, 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 they kind of uh, made a study on this and they proposed a solution uh, for that. But so uh, you need to read the paper, but I just want you to be aware of, of these things, of these biases, and in language, there's a lot. So there's Marta Ruiz here from UBC. She's a, an expert in that. She's working a lot on trying to have systems that do neural machine translation without biases but also there are works in the multimedia field in that sense, okay? More, third lecture you had in this course. So first we did image classification, object detection, and I think that after that we, maybe the, then was the face recognition, yeah, the, the fourth one. Then we went into video, so you can exactly do the same for video. You know how to encode videos, we extract the CNN features, we feed it into an RNN, for example, there are other ways, but that's the simplest way. You have a, a feature for your video, and you can also generate captions with that, okay, from that representation. So that's okay. very quickly, but you can also generate captions for, for your videos, or video clips, if you want. Here at UPC, we are working in one type of problem, which is actually related. We are trying to go from uh, sign language uh, videos to the translation in text. And the way to attack this, so one basic one way, it's actually like uh, we encode the video and then we decode the text. It's like sign language uh, translation, yeah? Another problem, which is language visual to text, it's lip reading, right? I don't know, probably you're not net native English speakers, I think, but even if, it's, if, if you were, it would be really hard for you to understand what uh, this lady is saying. But for a neural network, that's not a big deal. Well, it's not a big deal, but it's solvable, right? So there are already neural networks that allow to do lip reading. And again, Please the story is always scene. the same. Actually, in this world, they crop the lips, you extract visual features, you got it into a, in, with an LSTM because it's a sequence of, so you, you, you encode the lips, you extract uh, convolutional features, you encode it, you encode it with a, a GRU, it's a type, a flavor of RNN, okay? Actually it's bidirectional, so you encode in both directions. And then uh, you can decode the text. Uh, you can, you can uh, predict the text. In this world, they're using something called CTC loss, which probably you have never, how many of you have heard about it? Jana because her bachelor thesis was about it, but it's, it's a loss that allows to align, so to train your networks with sequences that are not aligned, okay? So this has been, it was introduced for the uh, case of uh, automatic speech recognition, right? In which, you, okay, you have people speaking and then you have the transcripts, but in general, no, there are, there's no alignment, right? And actually it's, super, it's very hard to align if somebody's speaking exactly in which moment it, they are saying that word, right? But then, um, Alec Graves proposed a, a loss that uh, allows you to train that without not explicit, not explicit alignment. What you only need is that the order is the same, that, that you keep the order, right? If, if the words are in, if you, the words are spoken in, in an order, uh, they must be in the same order in the transcript, but that, that's all, okay? 
So combining these two, these tools, you can have uh, lip reading. Or this one, uh, also from maybe a bit more spectacular, the breathing okay. in the wild from BBC that footage, that's for us, from Uriol Vinyals, uh, DeepMind, and, and Yves Sisserman. Um, but you see that the, the results are quite impressive in terms that it, it's possible to solve it. And again, the solution should be quite understandable for you. Quite, you should be familiar with that. You have the, the lips, the face. They did a, a crop on the face. You encode that with a convolutional neural network, you extract your features, you feed that into an LSTM, these are the time steps, you have your representation, and then you decode, so that those are on top, these are the, the words that you would decode, that you would transcript, and actually there is also an attention layer, okay? In this scheme, there are two branches, there's the video and the audio branch, so if there's the audio, then it wouldn't be like deep reading, it would be like improving speech recognition with video, which, which also helps, okay, if you want to do speech recognition and you have the video, that will help. But if you look at the, at the work at the paper, you see that still they get reasonable results without the upper branch, which corresponds to the audio. Okay, it can still work with video only. More. So what if, uh, so in neural networks, there's an issue of interpretability. Okay, this means that, um, when your networks predict whatever, in this case, it's captioning, okay? Uh, quite often you want to know why they are predicting that. In, the terms, of, in terms of captioning, there's this concept called ground, grounding, which means like uh, when you predict whatever word, you indicate, so you want the network to indicate wh where in the image it's looking at, yeah? That's called grounding. In this work from last year, you know, baby chalk, what uh, they did is they, they got an image, they wanted to do captioning, and they used these tools of object detection, so they detected the objects, and the features of these detected objects were the ones that were actually given uh, to the system to generate the captionings. In such a way that when a word was predicted, it was quite easy to relate the, so as there was an attention mechanism, it was quite straightforward to know which of the detected objects was being referred was uh, when when it was being referred when the word was was generated during the captioning, yeah. So in, in that's what this could be trained end to end in a very natural way. You would have captionings that were grounded with the objects with the detected objects on the on over the image. Yeah. Here you have like some examples of of the results. For example, in the top. Left, a dog is laying on the grass with a frisbee, so in red you have the dog, and in green you have the frisbee. So you know when he was saying frisbee, it refers to that frisbee. And you have a, some, some evidence of where the network is looking. In the last uh, CPR, they did something, uh, same application, so they do captioning, but in this case, uh, contrary to the previous uh, one, they did not use, during training they didn't use any bounding boxes. There were no bounding boxes during training, it was uh, called uh, weak, weak grounding. So it means weak grounding because uh, it's not a bounding box, it just, it, these are stars, right? It just says more or less, that's more or less the objects. So actually, it was generating, it generates a heat map, and then they took the maximum value of the heat map as the weak grounding. But for training, so they just have pairs of, uh, or, or, yeah, pairs of images and captions, okay? But n th there was no annotation about this word is this, uh, this object at all. It was, discovered, if you want, no less. In this, in this other work, also from, from the last CEPR, uh, it's the opposite. Here, what they wanted to do is they, they wanted to modify the caption by saying, okay, I want a caption of this and this object, okay? So they, they had the object, they detected them, and say, okay, caption with this and these objects. So they control the captioning. Yeah, so you can kind of control what the system is doing and not just let it go. Yeah, so far so good. So, so they, they, they say uh, if they want it, so for example, imagine that, the, that here's a woman near bashes and a cell phone say, I don't want to have bash, bashes in my caption, right? So you say no, so I don't, I don't want this. And then, so they take control, like a young woman looks somewhere while, okay, that's another solution. 
That's what I mean. Yeah. So that was the first part. So far, so good. Okay, maybe we will not finish everything. Okay, it's quite extensive, but you have the slides. Good image synthesis. Uh, maybe you let me know if Alberto already talked about it. Okay, I'm not really sure. So another way is like, what if you feed the text a network and you want the network to generate the image? Okay. So, so did you see this with Albert? Maybe. So now, now we are generating images, but it's not it's not a label, but it's like a full sentence. Did you see this with Albert? Pumarola? No. Okay. So but anyway, but the story is kind of always the same. Um, Albert told you how to generate images. I think you had like one hour of how to generate images. So what if when you generate the image, you can condition? Probably he showed you that you can condition with ImageNet labels. I guess at least. Okay, if you, if you remember from Albert lecture, if you can condition from ImageNet labels, and the ImageNet label is a one-hot encoding, so it's a representation, why don't we just encode a sentence, it's a representation, and then condition the generation with that representation? And that's it, right? So we can have like richer uh, or more diverse images. So okay, that's not, maybe the results are not visually that spectacular, but that's 2016, and that's quite a lot for 2016. And the, oops, and the architecture they have is this one, right? Um, so they had the, the sentence, right? They encode it in a vector. They concatenate it with a noise vector. And that's it. And now, now this is a generator network, this is a discriminator network, and that's a GAN. Yeah? Um, so actually, uh, with, with Jana, um, okay, Fran is not here, but your teaching assistant, uh, he, we did something very similar to this, but instead of encoding the text, we encoded the, the speech of the speaker and, and we generated uh, images of faces. Okay, that's, that's not re actually language, but it, it, we follow the same scheme. So earlier when I was saying, whatever we do here with language, you could probably do it with speech. That's another option. Yeah? That's an... Uh, a word that appeared later, and which is the name is quite popular, Staggan, um, but still it's a higher, it's a better quality uh, generation of images, in this case of birds. Um, probably, maybe you wonder, do you, do, you, do you wonder why all the examples are about birds always? And do you have any hypothesis why? <laughs> no. Yes, so there's a, there's a data set, so the, the reason is that there's a data set with many birds, and so you you want some subtle differences, right? That so if you if you can do just captioning in the wild, like write anything, that's going to be very hard. But if you have something controlled, like birds, which but but still controlled, but a small modification, you should be able to see it. That's why people use this data set quite a lot. Yeah. Um, other words, uh, last year, these guys from Stanford, what they did is the sentence, instead of trying to generate directly from to Stagan, first they, 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 they generated an intermediate step, which were a graph. So given a sentence, they built a graph of the different entities and relations from the word, which is something that linguistics already, for them, it's already a challenge. So they had a solution for that, and they feed that again uh, into a, a GAN, and that allow to have a richer and much nicer uh, compositions, right? You see here an example comparing a stack gun with this uh, image generation with syn graphs. That's what they call a syn graph. This one is from uh, last CPR from IBM. Uh, so what they do, so it's always the same spirit, but here they tried with different approaches, so they first they built abstract scenes with a synthetic images, so they have a sentence like, Mike is surprised at the duck, the duck is tangled on the grill, Jenny is running towards Mike and the duck, so it's quite difficult. So the, the engine composes, makes a composition of, of the scene with, synthetically. Yeah. A guy on a motorbike with some people watching, so here, what, actually what it generates is just the object layout. So as they have enough data notated, it doesn't even generate the, the pixel, just the, the layout of the objects, okay? And actually, with, by having that, then later it's much easier 
to actually generate the synthetic image. So first you generate the layout of where you want the, the objects to be, and then you generate the, the pixels. That helps this intermediate step. step. Yeah? So several elephants working together in a line near water. OK, looks kind of convincing. If, if you look at it, I mean, convincing from far away. If you look at it in detail, it's, it's a disaster. But probably from, from where you are, it's good enough. Yeah? Another block? OK, so there's this uh, piece of question answering task that people felt a very surprised about it. Um, but it's not, I mean, now if you know the basics, it's not that, 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 that difficult. Um, so, so far, I, I always went from one modality to another. But actually, nothing prevents you to combine different modalities, right? And so you could have maybe text and image and fuse these two representations and decode something, right? For example, Banette here at the right back, you've done something similar. So can you explain very quickly what you've done? Yeah, we, we took a representation of different modalities and joined them in the modality we used best, the type of mentioned before, and DG15 for image filter. We joined them in this way with a combination of features. And then we use a third network, which used um, this integrated supervisor for the task of classification in this case. Yeah. Okay. So if you if you want maybe to combine modalities, that you can. So when network he, he concatenated features and and there are many very complicated ways to com combine features, but concatenating is, is normally it's not a bad one. So you can always start with this one. Okay. The later there are more complicated stuff, but concatenated it's not a disaster. At least to start with, it's it's a good option. So what if the task is, instead of whatever prediction Manette was doing, you have an image and you have a question about the image. But that's, oh, that's always the same, right? You, you combine them somehow, and you decode them. Right? So that's encode your sentence, your, your image, and you decode the answer. So it's always the same story. Yeah? The, the, like the, the main challenge here is how to merge, how to do this combination. And again, there are like different variations, but Concatenating is not, is not a bad option in, in, for many cases, or at least to start with. In this uh, line of research, there's something that I'd like to highlight, which is this paper called Dynamic Memory Networks, in which they, ac they actually kind of uh, encode. So, actually, so this was a bit more complicated. So they have uh, so this text question answering. So there's, there's a huge liter literature on text question answering. Okay. So on, People from linguistics have been exploring this problem for, for ages. And at some point, somebody, uh, probably well, the, the guys who invented Big Way, which are now in Facebook, David Parikh and Drew Batra, um, say, hey, these people from language, they have, they have this text question problem. Okay? And now we know how to encode images. So why don't we try to do visual question answering? And, and that has been one of the most successful uh, challenges that has been proposed in the last year, right? So that's the kind of things you, you must think about. Like maybe some, some problems that they are quite popular in a modality. What if I combine it with another one? Maybe that gives like some new challenge and nice applications, OK? So in this case, uh, dynamic memory, uh, memory networks, what it's nice, it's this episodic memory. So they use to, for text question answering. So there's, there are no images here. But also, they use it for visual question answering. And in this case, the episodic memory, it's kind of the, it's attending over the image, let's say, more or less. Maybe it, more, it makes more sense over the text, but, but they, they test it in, in both. And this episodic me memory, it's like uh, this, these are, I think Albert mentioned it in his talk on Friday that he was using memory to, yeah, to generate uh, clothes. If you remember that he put like Marshall Gember's clothes on everybody, right? So he said, yeah, I, I, one of the models that I have, it's a memory. And somebody asks, OK, how do you write to this memory? Is that a physical memory? And say, no, not really. Well, there's the key and update value, blah, blah, blah. OK, so, so that comes also from this uh, work. That's one of the first works that there was a memory that was uh, 
whose parameters how to write and read, they were learned, differentiable. There are a few words on this, okay? But this one is probably the most popular in terms of multimodal. And nowadays we've seen it that it has become, this type of models are becoming quite popular in things like object tracking or the object segmentation, right? Because they allow you not, not to forget uh, what the appearance of your object in, in previous frames. So also if you're in, the, in, this, in this field, you may, you may want to look at this dynamic memory network or the different variations that come out of it. So basically, in, in these ones, they, they kind of have a, yeah, they, they read and write with attention there. Other works, uh, so on VQA, so granted VQA, in this case, they, they want you to, so you, you have a question, you have different options, and they want you to uh, choose one option, but also, like, when you choose an option, like, say why you are picking that option. You must point at the object on the region, on the image, that, uh, that took you to take that decision. That's this, they call it grand big way task. Okay, this data set is called Clever, and it's, what's interesting from this data set is that it allows you to generate synthetic images for visual reasoning. Okay, so it's, it's more difficult and challenging the visual question answering normally because the kind of questions look are, are these an equal number of large things and metal spheres? So that's, and you must look at the image and solve that question, okay? So that these kind of questions uh, aim at, at making it very difficult to a network to, to learn biases, okay? So in the, especially in the first edition of VQA, the questions were like, what is the moustache made of? Okay. M many of the answers that were given, they were, you, you, they were given even without looking at the image because there were many biases. Maybe this is not the best question, but m like, I don't know. Who is wearing the horse? Okay, and maybe 90% of the answers were a man, okay? So that's, that, especially in the first version of the data set that you had these kind of issues. And then, in order to make it like really focusing on the reasoning part, they build this data set. And again, the, the idea here is the engine, that you can uh, generate new images very, very easily, okay? Any questions about it? It's called Clever. And people are, are so when, when, when you are looking for an answer that requires like maybe looking at different points of the image and, thinking, and making relations, then you move into visual reasoning. And that's supposed to be more challenging than just visual question answering. Okay, and, and it's in a kind of a discussion, anyway. So visual reasoning, uh, they, they did, they're having different solutions. In this first one, actually, what they did is they, they kind of uh, encode the question and they decode some kind of pseudo code, pseudo program that was later run uh, in an education engine, so it was quite a complicated uh, solution, but there are many people working on that. Okay, so if you want a nice challenge, that's, that's quite a, quite a big one. And actually there was this other work from uh, Google DeepMind which made it so much easier to solve this clever data set, or at least to, to have a very good uh, performance because they, they kind of look at the embeddings of, on the image in that direction. They tried all the possible pairs between embeddings and then by fitting that into a multilayer per second they obtained very good results. So it's look, so it was kind of a, a, a simplish way to solve it. Then there's also this task which is called multimodal machine translation for people that come for in machine translation in which you have an ans you have a, a word, uh, sorry, a sentence in a language, also an image, and you want to make the, the translation to uh, other languages, but the translation actually should meet the image to, for the proper translation, okay? So that's, uh, that's normally it's more the people from linguistics, they are quite interested in this task. And I'm afraid time we are out of time, so we will leave it here. Um, you can look at the last two topics, but they are very busy, but they are not going to be covered in the exam, okay? So don't worry about it. Um,